TRF receivers. One distinct limitation with all simple receiver circuits is that the performance achieved is very much dependent on the strength of the original RF broadcast signal present in the aerial. If this signal is weak, no amount of AF amplification after detection can make good this deficiency. In fact, a simple diode detector will not work properly if the RF signal applied to it is very weak. Thus, the simpler types of circuit only work well in areas of good broadcast signal strength. They will not pick up weak signals from distant TV stations at a sufficient level for good reception, no matter how many stages of AF amplification are applied. Improving the efficiency helps in passing as high a percentage of the original RF signal as possible to the detector stage, but it cannot in any way boost the original signal. The tuned radio frequency TRF receiver, however, does just that, amplifies the incoming RF signal before it is passed on to the detector. A block diagram of such a circuit is shown in figure 30, where it will be noticed two tuned circuits are involved, usually mechanically coupled or ganged together. The first of these accepts the required signal, i.e. tunes to the required frequency, which is then boosted by the RF amplifier and passed through the second tuned circuit on the detector. This is then followed by one or more stages of AF amplification as required. Basically, in fact, we have a conventional tuned circuit detector amplifier set up with the addition of a front end comprising a tuned circuit and an amplifier. The sensitivity of the receiver is improved by the fact that weaker incoming signals can now be handled successfully because they are boosted or amplified. Sharper tuning can also be employed and indeed is necessary to eliminate interference from broadcast stations operating on adjacent frequencies. This calls for greater attention to the tuned circuit design and is also the main reason why two tuned circuits are used, but considerably improves the selectivity of the receiver. Because of the boost the RF signal receives before it reaches the detector, considerably less amplification of the AF signal passed is required after the detector stage in order to yield a good listening level. This, in general, should improve the quality of the sound. The TRF layout, therefore, offers a number of distinct advantages, although it is more complicated and does require a number of extra components. Also, it is more advantageous with valve receivers than with transistor receivers, since the possible amplification or gain per stage with the former is inherently greater. Nevertheless, the transistor TRF receiver is perfectly practical, is a perfectly practical type, provided it is properly aligned and neutralized. Alignment refers to setting up the variable tuned stages accurately with each other. Net, or neutralizing, neutralization refers to control of internal feedback due to the internal capacitance of transistors, which, if not controlled, could lead to the RF amplifier stage becoming unstable and oscillating continuously, producing a howl or whistle in the loud speaker or phones. <coughs> Figure th 3-1 or 31 shows a straightforward three transistor TRF circuit which should be simple enough to lay out on a suitable chassis plate or pegboard with a similar positioning of components. 
The only thing not obvious from the circuit drawing is that C1 and C4 are physically combined in one actual component, a ganged tuning capacitor, and thus C4 does not appear as a physical entity on the component layout. This is indicated by the dashed line connecting the two components on the theoretical circuit drawing. In practice, this merely means remembering that C4 is the second half of the ganged tuning capacitor and the collector lead of transistor TR1 has to be connected to the appropriate tag on the tuning capacitor. The two coils, L1, L2, and L3, slash L4, also need further explanation. Otherwise, all the other components involved are perfectly standard. The two coil pairs are transformer wound or inductively coupled and different from the single winding we used previously for an aerial coil. Coil L1 slash L2 is wound on a 6 inch long 3 8 inch diameter ferrite rod as shown in figure 32. First, a paper sleeve is formed around the rod and on to this is wound L1, comprising 50 turns of 38 SWG enameled or double silk enameled wire. Each turn of the coil must be closed together. The ends can be secured with a dab of wax. Coil L2 is then wound on top of L1, starting at one end, but comprising only 10 turns of the same 38 SWG wire. It is thus only one-fifth the length of L1. Again, the ends of this coil should be secured with wax. This particular aerial coil can be used on a variety of the receiver designs which follow. The range of frequencies covered will depend on the position of the coil on the ferrite rod. Thus, whilst adjustment of the tuning capacitor associated with the aerial coil will tune in to a particular frequency, the position of the tuning capacitor corresponding to this tune frequency may not be entirely satisfactory, i.e. other stations of different frequency may be off the end of the tuning condenser movement. The practical way to set up a tuned circuit is this. With the receiver circuit switched on, adjust the tuning capacitor to about its mid position, i.e. in the case of a postage stamp trimmer capacitors, screw right down and then back off about half a turn. Then slide the aerial coil along the ferrite rod until a station is picked up with a frequency in about the middle of the band. Example, the third program in the medium wave band. Fix the aerial coil to the ferrite rod in the position with a dab of wax. The tuned circuit will then be capable of tuning over a maximum sweep up and down from the mid frequency via movement of the variable, variable capacitor alone. Coil L3 L4 is made in very much the same way except that the length of ferrite rod need only be about one inch. Also the paper sleeve must be a sliding fit to enable the rod to be moved in and out to adjust the inductance of the coil if necessary. There is also one other difference. Coil L3 consists of 50 turns of 38 SWG wire, the same as L1, but has a center tap, i.e. a barred loop at 25 turns. Coil L4 is 10 turns of 38 SWG wire wound over one end of L3. In the complete circuit, the two tuned circuits are tuned simultaneously by adjustment of the tuning capacitor, i.e. C1 and C4 vary together since they are ganged. Capacitor C3 controls the feedback from TR1, but adjustment of the ferrite core of L3 slash L4 may also be necessary to eliminate oscillation or howling. 
This is affected by the position of the components in the RF amplifier circuit, i.e. the components centered around TR1. And two important considerations apply to this part of the circuit. Number one, keep the leads connecting the various components as short as practicable. Number two, the coil L3 slash L4 must be screened from coil L1 slash L2 and adjacent components. The best way to do this is to cut a piece of thin aluminum sheet which can be bent to fit around L2 slash L3 just like a physical screen. Remembering that you must be able to reach the ferrite rod center to adjust its position if necessary. The rest of the circuit is straightforward to assemble and needs no special attention other than suitable mounting of the individual components and correct connection. You may find, however, that the performance can be improved by the addition of a capacitor C8 across the phones as shown dotted. Although the volume to be expected from this three transistor TRF circuit is appreciably higher than the than that obtainable by a simple crystal set with two stages of amplification, i.e. as given by TR2 and TR3, the design as shown still only specifies headphones or a deaf aid earpiece. Sufficient power should be available in areas of good radio signal strength for loudspeaker reproduction when the modification as shown in figure 33 can be tried, replacing the earphone in the circuit with an 80 to 1 miniature output transformer connected to a 3 ohm loudspeaker. Capacitor C8 is strictly necessary in this case. An interesting variation on a transistor TRF circuit is shown in figure 34, where only a single tuned circuit is used, and only two transistors. There is some loss of selectivity in the design so that the tuning is somewhat broader and thus reception is more liable to interference from neighboring broadcast stations. No alignment or adjustment of neutralization is necessary, however, so the circuit is much simpler to get working. It also has sufficient power to drive a loudspeaker through an output transformer and has the additional refinement of a volume control.